let me share my screen. I think you need to to stop sharing Alessio so I can start sharing. Thank you. Okay. Can everyone see my slides? Yes. Uh, sorry, I need to move this on the side. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the invitation for my very first uh, Zoom seminar. So this is uh, presenting some recent paper, uh, recent paper with Misha Ivanov and Julian Esgourg on the Hubble Penzias Wilson tension. Uh, the title of the paper was uh, a little less catchy, was h naught tension or t naught tension. So let me start by the motivations. So all uh, the CMB and isotropy analysis have built in, uh, you don't even realize it, uh, that the temperature of the CMB monopole is given by the measurement from FIRAS, which is measured very well, 2.725 plus or minus 0.6 millikelvin. Now, the Hubble rate today, uh, you can think of it basically as a proxy for how much expansion has occurred between recombination, between last scattering and today. This is why it gives you, it's a, you can think of it as a proxy for the distance, the angular diameter distance between last scattering and today. Similarly, the temperature of the CMB today, you can think of it as a proxy for how much expansion occurred between the temperature of recombination and today. So there should be some degeneracy between these two parameters. And the first question we had is whether one could maybe at least somewhat alleviate the Hubble tension by having a free, uh, by not fixing the CMB monopole temperature to fire us, but rather uh, leaving it free. The second motivation, so this is not, this idea of leaving T0 uh, very is not new. There were a couple of other studies, which I will uh, summarize later. But um, so what these studies found is that there is on the one hand, a huge effect uh, of varying T naught on CMB and isotropies, yet somehow it is not measurable uh, from CMB and isotropies only, at least with current CMB and isotropy only. And so the second, and I, I think actually the main mission of this paper is to clarify what are the actual physical effects of varying the CMB temperature monopole on uh, cosmological observables, in particular CMB observables. And if T naught is measurable from CMB anisotropies, uh, is that true, is that so or not? And how is it actually measurable? So I must start by a warning, which is that in the current uh, version we, we have on the archive, we actually have a mistake. And so I will take this mistake as an opportunity for a uh, you know more pedagogical uh, for as a pedagogical opportunity, uh, and so I'll get back to this later on. So, but basically, we did not correctly propagate the effect of varying the monopole temperature on the calibration of Planck, and unfortunately, this changes the numerical results quite significantly, and it significantly loosens uh, one of the results which we were uh, the happiest about, which is the CMB only bounds on uh, the CMB monopole. So I will get back to this in much more detail um, at the end of the talk. So let me start by telling you uh, about previous works uh, that try to vary a T naught. So 2008, Kluba and Sunyaev uh, varied the CMB monopole. And on the left, you see the fractional change in the free electron fraction as a function of redshift when you keep all other cosmological parameters fixed. And what they find is that you have a huge effect on uh, recombination. On the right is this effect propagated to the CMB and isotropy power spectrum. Again, once when you vary T naught, but you keep all the other cosmological parameters fixed. And they found that there is some uh, still important effect on uh, the CMB. Their conclusion there was that T naught should be included at the very least as an additional source of uncertainty in CMB anisotropy analysis. This point was taken further by Haman and Wong uh, in the same year. So here again, you have similar plots where you saw the solid lines are the variations of the power spectra with respect to 
the CMB monopole temperature. And the dashed lines in the background are, if you vary omega baryon by uh, fractional uh, variation, which is four times uh, that of T naught shown in this plot. So what they argue, and what is argued uh, you know, uh, visually in these plots is that the T naught is, uh, has a strong degeneracy with omega baryon. It has somewhat similar effects as omega baryon. And what they find now quantitatively uh, is that one millikelvin uncertainty in T naught would not actually affect the Planck error bars, even if uh, you see it looks like, uh, well, I guess it's a 0.1% variation in CL, so it's below the Planck uh, sensitivity. But they find that it could affect error bars significantly on omega baryon for if you have an experiment which is cosmic variance limited up to L2500. Now, a caveat in this work is that they implicitly make the same uh, error as we did in terms of the calibration, uh, which is because they are assuming implicitly that Planck, well, explicitly they assume that Planck or their experiment is calibrated to the Faris dipole. And again, I will go back to this a bit later. More uh, previous work on this. The Planck collaboration in 2015 has a uh, section uh, subsection on the variation of T naught. And what they conclude here is, is that because of the strong degeneracy with theta MC, which is some approximate equation for the angular scale of the sound horizon, uh, they say that no constraint on T naught can be obtained using Planck data alone. External data sets such as the BAO is there, are therefore required to break this geometric degeneracy. And they measure T naught from Planck plus BAO, and I'll show you how this uh, how this works uh, later on, to be uh, consistent with the Fires value. And lastly, the uh, core collaboration, uh, well, uh, in 2016, also have a little section on T naught, and they say that it is possible to measure T naught from CMB observations only, provided we exquisitely measure the angular scale of acoustic oscillations. And what I will show you is that actually this is not what would help you measure T naught. Uh, it's not measuring this acoustic scale theta s very well. Rather, it's measuring lensing uh, better that would allow you to measure T naught from CMB only. And again, a caveat for their analysis is that they, uh, a priori, use the same default Monty Python code, which has the incorrect propagation of the uh, variation of T naught on how Planck is calibrated. And again, I'll, I'll explain more, more detail at the end. Okay, so this is for the introduction and past work. Let me now tell you a little bit about the physics of T naught. So first, in terms of the background uh, evolution. So the standard way that we parameterize uh, you know, cosmological functions, cosmological parameters, is we talk about redshift or scale factor, uh, and we use omega b, omega c. This is a parameterization where um, uh, time is parameterized relative to today. Well, the, the expansion is parameterized relative to today. The densities are parameterized relative to today. Now, physical processes in the universe don't care about today. They occur at a fixed energy scale or a fixed temperature rather than some fixed redshift. Physical quantities, moreover, and by a physical quantity, I mean something which is constant throughout cosmic history. If we measure it now and we measure it in a billion years, we would get the same uh, value. So for example, such physical quantities would be the photon to baryon number ratio, or the baryon to photon number ratio proportional to omega baryon over T0 cubed, and the dark matter to baryon abundance ratio, uh, omega C over omega B. So those are physical quantities. So when you are going to vary the CMB temperature today, rather than using redshifts, omega baryon, omega C, it is much more sensible to parameterize uh, the background and all of the cosmological quantities in terms of the temperature and in terms of the baryon to photon number ratio and in terms of the dark matter to photon number ratio, if you will, omega c over t0 cubed. To illustrate this, if you write the Hubble rate in terms not of redshift, but rather in terms of temperature, you see that this is something that depends on omega lambda, on omega m over t0 cubed, 
times uh, um, some t cubed and some function of temperature, which we know very well uh, for the uh, photon uh, density. And this is assuming a constant and effective, but if you assume big bang nucleosynthesis, uh, well, and effective should also be a function of omega p over t zero cubed. Uh, well, sorry, and effective should, uh, anyway, this and effective goes into the, uh, the hashtag here in front of t to the fourth. Big bang nucleosynthesis given some and effective uh, occurs at a fixed temperature and again given some ineffective only depends on the baryon to photon number ratio. Again this omega b over t0 cubed. You can also show you can rewrite the recombination equations and show explicitly that the recombination history rather than being a function of redshift and omega b, omega c, etc is a function of temperature depends on the Hubble rate at some temperature, hence depends on omega m over t0 cubed, and depends, of course, on omega b over t0 cubed. And if you assume standard BBN, the helium abundance, which affects recombination, also depends on this ratio, uh, the baryon to photon uh, number ratio. So this is visually to illustrate the last point. So if you compute the change of the recombination history as a function of redshift when you vary the C and D monopole. And again, this is showing the standard cosmological parameters uh, kept fixed, omega B, omega CDM. It looks like you have a huge variation. Now, if instead you keep omega B over T0 cubed and omega C over T0 cubed fixed, and you show the uh, recombination history as a function of temperature, then here I am varying T naught again by plus or minus 10%, just, just like on the left, but all of the curves are sitting on top of one another. So recombination is a function of omega B over T0 cubed, omega C over T0 cubed, and temperature, period. So all of the apparently large fluctuations, variations that you see on the left are really uh, in some sense artificial. They're resulting from you know, effectively varying the uh, baryon to photon ratio rather than keeping it fixed. Moving on to perturbations. So similarly, when we talk about redshift, you know, when we talk about co-moving scales, we're really defining them to be a physical scale today. Now, instead of talking about physical scales today, you may wanna talk about physical scales at a given fixed temperature. Say if you wanna talk about physical scales at a temperature of one Kelvin, you want to re redefine your co-moving numbers as k over t naught. You can go into mein Birchinger. Uh, I encourage you to do the exercise, and you will see that the transfer functions, in fact, rather than depending on you know k, redshift, standard cosmological parameters, you can show that it depends. You can you can uh, eliminate all of the t zero dependence by making them functions of this k over t0, omega b over t0 cubed, et cetera, and a function of temperature. Now the primordial power spectrum, uh, if you express it in terms of this physical, uh, well, this, this rescaled wave number at a constant fixed temperature rather than today, you see that it will be proportional to AS times t0, and this is an NS, there's a typo, sorry. So AS times t0 to the NS, minus one power. Okay, so this combination is what you should keep, think of keeping constant. This is what show, tells you the degeneracy effectively with AS if you uh, vary T naught. Moving on to propagating all of this to CMB primary anisotropies. Okay, so first, if we think of small angular scales, the anisotropies there are mostly sourced near uh, the last scattering surface. In any case, they don't have any contributions from uh, the dark energy era. Perturbations on a fixed physical scale, as we have seen, their amplitude will depend on AS times T0 to the NS minus one, on all of these, on these ratios, this number uh, ratios, omega B over T naught cube, omega C over T naught cube, et cetera, et cetera. In particular, the sound the physical sound horizon at last scattering. So the temperature of last scattering is fixed. It does not depend on T0. It only depends on the baryon to photon ratio, dark matter to photon ratio. 
the sound horizon, the physical sound horizon atlas scattering also only depend on this omega b over t0 cubed, omega c over t0 cubed. Now you want to translate sound horizon to an angle. And for this, as was explained uh, by Marius, you need the angular diameter distance between today, because now we do have to account for the fact that we make these observations today, and the last scattering epoch. And so this does depend on uh, T0, and it also depends on the cosmological constant or equivalently H0. Okay. So uh, if you fix number ratios, omega b over t naught cubed, omega c over t naught cubed. And if you fix theta s, which is observed, measured very well, small scale CMB anisotropies should, now you, you should have absorbed all of the dependence on t naught. However, on large scales, the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect depends on the scale factor, the amount of expansion between matter lambda equality and today. And so this depends on T naught, uh, as I will quantify a little bit uh, more in a couple of minutes. So this is to show you if you fix the standard cosmological parameters on the left and you vary the temperature of the monopole today, this is all at fixed tau ionization, you get these uh, huge effects on CMB anisotropies. But in reality, if you now keep these more physical parameter is constant. And if you keep the sound horizon, the angular scale of the sound horizon constant, you absorb most of the effect of T naught on small scales, but actually you do generate some new effect on large scales. Uh, if you look at the TT, this is because of this uh, ISW effect. Uh, for uh, the polarization, I haven't uh, we haven't looked at this in, in detail, but what I suspect is happening on large scales is that if you keep tau reionization constant uh, and you change T naught, you're gonna change a little bit what is the, say, angular diameter distance to the epoch of reionization. I suspect this is what you're seeing on large scales. So looking into this ISW a little bit to understand its sign uh, and the direction of degeneracies. So if you uh, fix, omega b over t0 cubed, omega c over t0 cubed. Around the best fit, you can calculate the dependence of theta s on h and on t0. And you can see that it's t0 to the 0.22 h to the 0.19. You can also rephrase this in terms of uh, a dependence on the redshift of uh, matter lambda equality. So if you have a fixed, very well measured theta s, you expect a very strong, from the first scaling I wrote, you expect a very strong correlation uh, al along the direction h proportional to t0 to the minus 1.2. From the second correlation, you see that if you increase t0, you also uh, need to lower the redshift of matter uh, lambda equality. And as a consequence, you will have less integrated Sachs-Wolf effect which is what you're seeing in these plots for increased T0. So the plots on the right, you see that you get a smaller amount of ISW, okay, when you increase T0. Um, so the ISW effect is one of the ways that you can break this uh, geometric degeneracy between T0 and uh, Hubble. In addition to these primary anisotropies, there's also lensing. So again, as we just saw, if you increase T0, you have a lower redshift of matter uh, lambda equality. As a consequence, your pot gravitational potentials will decay less between uh, Z lambda and today, and you will have a higher uh, lensing potential, which is what you see in this plot. Increasing T0 leads to a higher lensing potential. All right. So this is uh, the summary of what I've been telling you now. So We've shown that, so, so again, what others have done before is point out that you can have a large effect uh, of T0, the monopole on CMB and isotropies, but that it is somewhat correlated with other parameters, but no one had actually uh, pointed out what are these correlations. So here we have derived explicitly, what are the correlations? So uh, T0 appears mostly through these combinations, okay? In the, 
small scale uh, primary CMB anisotropies. These correlations, so first of all, because of the theta s, uh, uh, theta s being very well measured, you get a strong geometric degeneracy between T naught and H naught, which is what we were hoping that maybe we could alleviate the Hubble tension with changing T naught. And how does this degeneracy get broken is through two effects, which is on the one hand, the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect, because this is a late time effect and it does depend on how much expansion you had between dark energy uh, domination, uh, the start of dark energy dom domination in today, and lensing. So it is in principle possible to measure T0 from CMB anisotropy. Okay. The way you measure it is not by having a more precise measurement of theta s, but rather is through ISW, which now is, you know, we're not going to measure it better, but especially lensing. Okay, lensing is uh, what uh, helps you break uh, these geometric degeneracies. So now I want to uh, move to the error that we have in the paper and turn it again into a pedagogical opportunity. Uh, and tell you how Planck actually calibrates, which is something I hadn't thought about before. So what does Planck measure? And this is the case for any telescope. They measure some kind of electric power. This electric power, if the instrument is, is uh, well built, it should be linear in the actual uh, intensity of electromagnetic waves or linear in the temperature. Um, now, the, there's a dipole uh, in uh, there's a CMB dipole, which has two contributions. There's first of all, some constant contribution from the motion of solar system uh, with respect to the CMB rest frame. And this is constant in the time scale of the uh, observations. And then you have a time varying orbital dipole, which is proportional to the T0, whatever T0 is, whatever T0 is times the velocity, the orbital velocity. Now this orbital velocity is something that is very well known. So out of this time varying dipole, the power that you get is this unknown gain times this, in our case, let's say unknown T0 times this very well known V orbital. So if you know this V orbital very well, you measure the power, what you can infer is the product of the gain times T0. So what Planck really measures is uh, if you divide the power measured by this uh, coefficient, gain, gain times T0, what Planck really measures is the fractional temperature variation. Okay? And Planck measures this extremely well, re even if we had absolutely no idea of what the monopole was, even if there was no FIRAS measurement whatsoever, we could still use Planck the same way. We could still say play, Planck measures delta T over T to the same exquisite precision. Okay? Now, what is provided in the likelihoods, probably for historical reasons, because WMAP was not calibrated in this way, is not delta T over T, but rather T0 virus times delta T over T. So it's in units of micro Kelvin. So in the first version, so really it's, it's a delta T which is provided under the assumption that T0 is what is measured by virus. In V1 of this paper, we had, you know, compare this to T0 model times delta T over T model. So implicitly, we had assumed that Planck calibrates, measure the, the calibration of Planck implies a measurement of the absolute delta T rather than really Planck is uh, able to measure the fractional delta T. And I emphasize here just to make it very clear, this is not that we had some unit mistake, okay? It's just that we multiplied by the theoretical T0 rather than multiplying by the fire ST0, which is effectively what uh, Planck uh, data is present. This is the way that the Planck data is presented. So it turns out that this actually changes the results quite a lot. And it, I don't want to get into the details here, but basically we were uh, overestimating uh, the effect of lensing. So at a fixed amplitude of the primary power spectrum, in the one case we were fixing, in the previous case we were fixing AS times T0 squared. And as a consequence, we were increasing the effect of lensing, uh, the, the impact of T0 on lensing, because lensing is proportional to AS, which is AS T0 squared over T0 squared. So we were um, adding a 
artificial T0 squared dependence on two lines in, if you want. So having corrected this, this is uh, literally fresh off the press. Misha sent this to me an hour ago, uh, Misha Ivanov. Uh, so let's focus first on the top. I don't know if I can move my mouse, no. So if you look first on the top of these uh, giant triangle plots, so the cosmological parameters that we use here are not the standard omega b, omega c, and as, even though, so there's a typo for as. It's really as times t0 to the ns minus 1, where t0 is normalized to firas, but it's this varying t0, and omega b over t0 cubed, and omega c over t0 cubed. So if first, if you look at the first, you know, non-funny looking part of the plot, you see that even if you leave t0 free, you still measure with Planck the baryon to photon ratios and the dark matter to photon number ratio with essentially the same accuracy as if you had um, uh, a T0 which was fixed to Firas. And this is related to what Marius was saying in his talk, which is that the shape of the CMB, so if you know T0 in, in the case that he was describing, the shape of the CMB tells you something about omega B and omega C. Well, re here, if you vary T0, really the shape of the CMB tells you something about omega B over T0 cubed and omega C over T0 cubed. And you measure them essentially just as well. However, uh, there is a huge degeneracy with, uh, between Hubble and T0. So let me zoom on to this other triangle plot. And again, this is literally an hour old, so I'm not going to comment too much on it. But let me just say a couple of things. So the diagonal green line on the lower bottom is this the direction of degeneracy of constant scale, angular scale of the sound horizon. And again, you see that you have this very strong degeneracy between T naught and H naught, and it is broken. So the reason this line is not infinite, it is broken by lensing uh, and ISW, but also uh, we had to actually impose a prior on omega lambda, big omega lambda, strictly positive. Uh, because otherwise, it would have continued to even higher T naught and lower H naught values uh, on the left. So, in one sense, it is, it is true that it's very difficult to measure uh, the monopole temperature from CMB only. Uh, you have a much, much broader error bar than you would have from FIRAS or anything else. And the, in fact, you, you need to have a prior on having uh, you know, a positive cosmological constant. Otherwise, you would have an even worse error bar. Another comment is that, so in the first version of the paper, our green you know, 2D contour overlapped with the uh, shoes gray band. And so what we had said is that, well, you know, what is usually done is to say, I'm going to use Planck plus Firas, and then I find a tension with shoes. But one could also say, well, I could use Planck plus shoes and then you find a tension with Firas. So one could you know, interchange the H naught tension and T naught tension. Now here we find actually that the, so the, the temperature is pushed to much higher temperatures and the Hubble to even lower temperatures. So it kind of looks like as if the Planck is in fact in tension not only with shoes, but also uh, in milder tension, but also in a milder tension with Firas. Um, the blue curve is adding the constraints from baryon acoustic oscillations at a fixed omega b, omega m, both divided by t naught cubed. And as was discussed by Marius, this is a different, uh, in, in this case, this gives you a different degeneracy direction between t naught and h naught. Uh, and this is why you can measure, if you combine Planck with BAO, you can actually measure t naught. But again, so this is a very fresh plot and we still need to think about the implications. We haven't quantified all of the uh, you know, this, uh, tensions between all the different models, but it kind of looks to me like Planck is in tension with not only shoes, but also uh, mildly in tension with Firas. And this tension could be related to the high A lens because pushing to higher T naught uh, also uh, leads to higher lensing, but you know, it also would lead to higher lensing four point function. So uh, it's not exactly clear. So let me conclude. The first thing that we did hopefully is to clarify how precisely CMB anisotropies depend on the CMB monopole. 
okay so it was known uh, that there are some degeneracies with other parameters but no one ever showed this explicitly and so here we show explicitly what these degeneracies are and we do show that in principle T0 can be measured from CMB and isotropy alone but the way it can be measured is not through having a better angular diameter distance, um, theta s, but it is through ISW and the lensing effect. So if we measure CMB to you know, high, smaller scales like stage four, et cetera, we should be able to measure T naught better from CMB and isotropy alone. So we do present here uh, the first measurement of uh, the CMB monopole from Planck data alone. Uh, though it is much worse than what we have in V1. So, you know, beware that uh, what we say in V1 regarding this aspect is not correct. Uh, we do find that Planck prefers higher value than, T than FIRAS. So it is in tension with FIRAS, uh, but it's also in much higher tension with shoes. And if you include BAO, you uh, find agreement with FIRAS, but uh, not agreement with shoes and uh, keep posted for the updated results, uh, which will include the proper dependence of T0 on the calibration. And uh, yeah, I will stop here. Is there any questions? Uh, thank you. Uh, so there are a couple of comments and uh, questions in uh, chat. So uh, uh, can, you, can you see the chat yourself? I, I, saw, I saw, yeah, I just am seeing yeah. now. So, so maybe Kluba. you can just uh, read the question. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. So Jens Kluba, uh, you need a spectrum for the dipole to do the component separation. So that depends on T naught. It's just commenting on the point that yeah. you're saying that you can literally do this. With, delta T over T is not measured directly with the with Planck. It is, it is uh, and you also need the, you, you need the spectrum of the dipole. In fact, you can, by measuring the spectrum of the dipole through anisotropies, can test as well uh, the, the monopole temperature. It just, just, that was just my comment there. I think it's not correct to say that it's independent measurement of T naught. So, so by dipole, you mean the orbital dipole or? No, no, just the, just the energy distribution of the, uh, of the, it's the derivative of the black body spectrum, which is the uh, average monopole spectrum. So you need the derivative of that. And that it depends on the uh, temperature of the CD the derivative itself, right? Of, of that. The, the the or to what, yeah. Just, just the dipole, the energy distribution as a function of frequency is, you cannot relate to different frequencies without knowing the, the uh, monopole temperature. So. That it's not independent measurement of the monopole okay, temperature. Right. So it's not only the amplitude, but it's also the spectrum needs to be known. In fact, that is an opportunity for measuring the spectrum as well as, as, as I pointed out in some of my previous papers. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk, Jens, because uh, that could, yeah, we, we need to understand this very, uh, very clearly. So let's talk, let's talk offline, uh, but thank you. And then Vivian Poulain, is the lower H0 higher T0 related to the low L anomaly perhaps? Uh, I, so I don't think that the ISO, I did a little bit of a, a simple Fisher analysis with uh, Planck uh, noise and the measurement from T0, uh, T0 is mostly constrained through lensing. It's like 70% of the SNR squared is lensing and 30% ISW. So, but, but I don't know. Uh, but I think ISW is subdominant to lensing. Marius agrees. Uh, question, why does there appear to be no effect from the early ISW effect, only the late? So early ISW effect, uh, which is related to matter radiation transition, right? So yeah, that's the, right. Yeah, right. So the yeah, just to clarify what I meant, just yeah, right. on your plot, on your yeah, plot, yeah. it looked like uh, most of the... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fix the better parameters. It's like yeah. all the all the action is at LS, L of a few tens, which is yeah. late so, ISW, but I saw nothing right. at like a hundred. Yeah. So 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 the temperature again. If you think of things in terms of temperature, if you fix omega b over t zero cubed, omega m over t zero cubed, then the temperature of matter radiation equality does not depend on t naught. Okay. So the early ISW effect does not. Uh, I don't think the early ISW effect is affected here. If you think of things in terms of at what temperature do you think? Uh, okay, okay. I guess I, I think I see because it, it matters that um, the late ISW is the transition from matter to lambda. 
yeah there's not it's, it's not just that there's a dependence on isw in general it's yeah okay i think I it's, yeah this is specifically yeah for for lambda yeah if you fix data s then you're necessarily moving lamb omega lambda when you change them uh, to zero um and then alessio notari do we have any reason to suspect that Faris could have been wrong i don't think uh i would certainly not go and say this i think Faris has been actually confirmed by other independent measurements which are which had a uh, higher error bar, but still, um, I, at least I don't have any reason to suspect that Faris uh, should be wrong. Uh, so yeah, Vivian, uh, this is what I was just saying to Marius. So Vivian says it's because omega m over omega r. So really, omega m over omega r does change, right? So omega m over t zero, omega m over omega r would go as omega m over t zero to the fourth. So this does change. But so a equality does change, but again, we don't really care about a equality. We care about t equality, uh, and t equality in this case does not change. Um, so then, who is wrong? So Jens, if your question is about the uh, normalization, honestly, now we'll have to discuss more. Okay. So no, 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 no. I mean, I, I uh, mean more in the sense of Firas, Shoes, Planck. What, what do you uh, do? You see any potential for a real potential forward in terms is, of like figuring can, out something? This is uh, the the Bayesian answer, right? I can show you the posteriors, and then uh, you can you can make your own. Uh, <laughs> you can make your so, own. But 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 not not to hijack this, but just given the fact that. Um, Virus has been has been, of course, as you say, uh, you know, the, the the general measurement has been confirmed um, by other experiments with a much larger, significantly larger error bar. But it's also the only measurement out of these which we are not having any real progress on uh, future uh, in the future perspectives. Um, so I'm just wondering, do you, do you think maybe uh, you really think okay, Virus is absolutely correct, and we are. We are I mean, not, you would um, have to. So it's not about it, here. To be clear, it's not about lowering the error bar of Firas, right? It's uh, you would have to move it. Yeah. The, Central uh, value. Yeah. It's like I mean, what we had found is like 400 sigma in the first version of the paper. So, you know, I don't know if if your question is about do we need to measure it more precisely, more like more. Yeah, we don't need to measure it more precisely. If there's any issue with the accuracy of Firas, of whether that has a bias, I, I'm not aware of this. But I don't think having more precision would, would change anything here. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, all right. If there are no more questions, then uh, uh, oh, there is uh, one, one last question. Uh, one so question. from uh, Kir Plum, uh, no other experiment constrains T0 to a level needed. Is it true? So by needed, uh, this is related to Jens's question, I guess. I'm not sure by what is needed here. My understanding is that all of the other measurements of T0 are consistent with Firas, just with a, with a bigger error bar, but certainly a much smaller error bar than uh, what you can measure from Planck alone. So you would have to have an experiment that somehow measures T0, which is many, many, many sigma away from what Firas measures in order to alleviate this tension. Have you played the game of, of just rescaling T0 so that it would match with shoes and just asking, uh, asking actually a question what T0 it would be uh, in order to max, um, uh, so not marginalizing over it, but just saying what would you need in order to get the right uh, agreement? Yeah, yeah, so we, we did play the game in this first, uh, well, actually it is right here. So if you do plank plus shoes is the gray curve. You see that the best fit you need. No, no but that, that gives you an impression of an error marginalization. What, what if you just say, let me try and fix uh, the value and actually push it so that it matches? Uh, I'm just asking, like, basically, the, the, the uh, just an, yeah, OK. So is it the same thing as just saying I'm lowering this red line down here? Because you want to intersect, if you believe theta s, you just want to intersect. OK, you know, yeah, yeah, you can. Right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is just, this gray curve is just really the intersection. So, yeah, you would get something around two point, uh, whatever, this is 2.6 or something like that. So, quite lower than uh, Fire S. All right. 
thank you again and thanks also Marius and uh, Alessio for a very nice talk. Um, so uh, that's it for today, but please be back on Thursday for auctions. So bye. Thank you. Bye.